Welcome to the Neophyte in the Woods podcast with Andrew McDowell. of the new fight in the woods podcast i'm your host andrew mcdowell we are proud members of the change your pov podcast network and this week on the show i'm joined by my friend jason Crichton, and we're going to talk today about a beginner's approach to archery and all the various things you need to know to get started how does that sound jason okay yeah it sounds right. good before before we get yeah. started though how's life with the kid man it's an adventure i bet <laughs> <laughs> She's um she's good. She's almost she's almost eight months old. Wow, and that time flies, man! Yeah, Holy man. crap! Yeah, and it's um you know it's always a new something new every day. I'm sure she's um she's saying da a lot, like again and nice. again and again. So I've already won. My wife doesn't realize it yet, but that's that's the only victory I I need in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's something i'll be pushing um whenever yeah i whenever we have kids um either trying to push so that um the first words are daddy or the first word is dear uh <laughs> one of the two um daddy would be acceptable to my wife she would be sad but it would be acceptable yep. deer would not be acceptable so <laughs> well you know we're 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 pretty aggressive bruins fans up here and um I've always joked that I want her first phrase to be expletive deleted the habs because you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm completely okay with that. <laughs> so we're going to, uh, or at least I'm going to try to make that happen. It's going to be very expensive. We're doing um, dollar in the swear jar for an F-bomb Ooh. and uh, 25% for all the lesser swears. <laughs> So that's, that's good. I'm going to, I'm going to make it worth my while if I'm going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I would too. And how is married life? Uh, good. Actually really, really good. And how was the deer season? This was probably the most I hunted, um, in the past couple years, mm -hmm. this past year. Uh, so I got time to go out. Uh, the problem was I didn't get a deer. So mm -hmm. I'm in kind of a, a similar scenario where, I spent more time in the woods this year than I ever have before, sun up to sundown, every single day except for one during my um, during my like hardcore like actual going on deer season, and um, you know that 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 week after Thanksgiving, and I just I wanted to be at home, like I wanted to be in the mm -hmm. woods, I wanted to get a deer, but at the you know I wanted to be home, I didn't want to miss anything with my kid. Right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, bringing a kid to the table definitely um, changes the mindset. I would I would imagine. Um, at least that's what I've seen from from my friends. Yeah. Um, you know, they like um, one of the guys that uh, does some work for the website. Um, he's actually a, a coworker of mine too. Mm -hmm. um, he had a kid. Uh, this kid just turned one a couple okay. weeks ago. Um, so he was extremely happy to. Um, shoot the first buck that he saw. Mm -hmm. um, and he was only out for maybe a total of 20 hours. 
Wow. Um, and he was happy because then he got to spend more time with his kid. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I mean, I enjoy my time outside, but, um, you know, I'm sure once I have a kid, I'll be, I'll be thinking, you know, yeah, uh, this is nice, but let's, uh, let's get back home to the kid and, you know, at least until, uh, kid gets old enough to be able to take him with me. Exactly. Exactly. So. You know, and that's something that my wife and I are already skirmishing over. It's, you know, I'm never going to force my daughter into doing something she doesn't want to do, except rooting for the Bruins, Patriots, and Red Sox. <laughs> um, she can root for a, another lesser team when it comes to basketball. But, like, I, I will never, ever, ever force her to go hunting, but I want more than anything for it to happen. Yeah, I... And... I mean, I would obviously prefer the hunting, yep. um, but I think more than anything for me, the thing, you know, same deal is, you know, I don't want to force my kids to yep. do anything they don't want to. Um, but the one thing that I'm really going to try to push the hope that they do like is to at least just be outside. You mm-hmm. know, it doesn't have to be hunting. Um, yep. I'm not a fisherman, but if they want to fish, great. Um, if they just want to go on hikes or mountain yep. bike, like anything that gets them outside, anything that gets them off the screens mm-hmm. and, um, you know, basically getting in trouble. You know, yep. it's, it was hard for me to get in trouble when I was younger because I was always in the woods. You know, yep. it's easy way to stay away from that. So, yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's definitely true. Like I look at, at my, you know, my brothers and I was, I liked being outside, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't playing in the woods. I was a suburban kid, uh, you know, I, I'm playing video games and playing baseball, that kind of stuff. But like, and then my brothers were the town I grew up in changed. It became a little bit more urban, a little bit more citified, less suburban. And they got in a lot of trouble because they weren't busy. Like I was you right. know, just doing all that stuff. Yep. So, yep. you know, we live in a, in a, in frankly, a rural community. There's farms all around me. That's good. And, you know, we're across the street from a huge park with a huge lake in it. So lots to do. My wife is a, you know, a, a jock. So she, grew up playing softball and all that so you know she's not gonna lack for diversions if her diversion of choice happens to be fly fishing and chasing pheasant and whitetail so much the better for me but if she wants to play softball or whatever you know that works too right absolutely but that's actually a a, you know a good transition for us you know we've we've done the uh you know we've kind of caught up a little bit i figure maybe now we want to we want to dive into um talking about hunting with a, a stick and a string yeah it sounds good to me so you know we've 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 worked this out a little bit we had some some conversations via email and on direct message on 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 twitter um i guess you know kind of taking this from from my perspective and the perspective of the show which is approaching stuff as a new hunter somebody who's just learning about these things um i'm gonna ask you a tough question and okay it's gonna be one of those really difficult open-ending questions. Where do you start? Like, what's what's step one for getting involved in bow hunting, other than wanting to do it? Yeah, um, when you, I'll I'll preface all of our conversation by saying when you first approached me about talking about this topic, I thought this would be great. Um, I love talking about archery and hunting mm-hmm. and everything. And then I sort of thought, well, it's been. 20 years since I started mm-hmm. archery hunting. So I have to, uh, I've been trying uh, for a while now to sort of reach back and think about mm-hmm. um, what I needed then. And personally, the very first thing you need when you to start archery hunting, and, and that is a mentor um, mm-hmm. without a doubt, someone to help you figure out what you actually need um, and make sure you're on the right track. Okay. Um, if you don't have that, um, it's going to take you a whole lot longer to learn your way into archery hunting. Mm-hmm. And and with that wasted time, I'm going to assume is going to come a lot of wasted money, which is also um, I think, a very real concern. Uh, I'd, I'd say a little bit of money, uh, but more than anything, it's going to be wasted time. Mm-hmm. Um, you may waste some money on, you know, your broadhead selection or arrows or um, things like that. But there's enough now there's an, enough information online mm-hmm. that you can keep yourself from wasting too much money. Um, so for me, I sort of think it's more of wasted time um, yeah. where, 
you know, you could have something fixed or not even have it as an issue um, that if you try to do it all on your own, mm -hmm. um, it ends up being really, really time consuming to try to fix what might be wrong, uh, what you're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And is that tactics? Is that practice? Is that technique? Is or is that it is all that of is above? all of the above? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and and when I say a mentor, it doesn't even have to be necessarily one person. Um, you know, I mean, my father was sort of my main mentor, mm -hmm. but you know, I had um, my uncle also helped me out with that. But then uh, I also uh, got into a youth at the time, youth mm -hmm. um, archery league, and just being in a, at a local club that where there's people that know archery, um, you know, as much as my dad was helping me with some stuff, you know, the technique and things like that, he didn't necessarily mm -hmm. know everything. Uh, so, you know, the guys at the club that were really good shooters, they'd look and say, Hey, you're doing this. This is why you're throwing these shots. Okay. Um, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, whether it's a, a mentor, someone that's sort of driving you into, uh, the sports, or um, if you don't have that one one or two people um, to even be like a hunting buddy, just find a local uh, archery club that you can join and um, be around and talk to, and just someone to to bounce questions off of. Um, I found I've personally found that a lot of the people that know what they're doing uh, mm -hmm. to join these archery clubs. Uh, you don't even have to ask. They just tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you have to sort of think about the, the criticism there. It's coming because they want to help you, mm -hmm. not um, because they're, you know, deciding that you trying to push you out or anything like mm -hmm. that. And, you know, I think that that's something that that's unique to, to the, that community. You know, I, I think that there's a, a certain camaraderie amongst hunters, but I think it, from what I've seen, it's amongst bow hunters it, it goes a step further because you're all facing the same kind of disadvantages where you know gun hunters you know you can stand up 150 200 yards not in massachusetts or pennsylvania necessarily but you know some other places and it, it's it's not easier but it's a different kind of hard yeah and i think that is um the biggest thing with archery is i mean it it is very tough Yep. to shoot a deer in archery season um you know the you have people out there that you know they only want to shoot um you know certain class bucks or things mm -hmm. like that which is absolutely fine if that's you know that's their decision if that's what they want to do that's great um but even just shooting a doe in archery season mm -hmm. is is tough um you know because you have to get them they're fairly close. You really yeah. have to outsmart them. And because archery hunters know that, I, I think going to your point, they just really feel a need to share the information they have mm -hmm. with other people um, to help them out because they know that some people are, you know, someone else is going to be doing that for them as well. Yeah. I think that there's a car, exactly the, the, the doing it for somebody else and having it done for you. There's a, there's a karma thing. You know, I, you know, without sounding too woo-woo, when I've had success in the woods or I've gotten really good opportunities in the woods, it's because I did something to help somebody else ahead of time because, A, it's the right thing to do. But I, I do truly believe that the universe has a way of working out, and I think that that, you know, whether or not people realize it, I think that that maybe influences decisions at the same time. Yeah, I think so, too. Um so, I, I mean, I try to help as many people out as I can um, along the way. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I, there's been, and basically because there's been a, a ton of people that have helped me along the way. Yeah. So I sort of want to, um, and, you know, give that to them uh, yeah. the way that someone gave it to me. Yeah. They pay it forward like that. Absolutely. That weird movie with that Osmond kid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, in terms of, of, selecting equipment obviously there's any number of people on the internet who will tell you what to do there are people say who will say that the only choice is to buy a hoyt the only choice is to buy a Ma uh, you know a matthews or whatever that's certainly a valid opinion i think you'd you know you'd say that's one way of doing it but one of the things in in my 
really basic research is other than, you know, Googling what bow should I buy? It seems the consensus is join a club or go to an archery shop that sells bows and, and is familiar and comfortable with, with hunters to get fitted. Can you tell me a little bit about that process? Because it's, it's completely foreign to me and presumably the listeners out there who have, who have never bow hunted before. Yeah, so the, the archery hunting world is unique in the aspect that people are very brand loyal Mm -hmm. um once they and which when you think about it makes sense once you find some that works that you like you're going to tell everyone that's the only way they should go Mm -hmm. um so you have basically you have three types of people uh in the world or uh, maybe four uh you have hoyt guys you have matthews guys uh then you have guys that don't really care what they shoot and then you got guys that are trying to find um the best equipment they can for the best price point that they can find. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, whenever I got my last bow, um, which was about five years ago, I went to a local archery shop that we have. Um, at that particular one, they sell Hoyt, Matthews, and Bowtech. Okay. Um, I told him sort of what I was looking to spend. He took one of each of those bows that would, one from each brand that would um, fit that price point told me to close my eyes, handed me bows, and I just shot. Um, and all I was doing was trying to feel which ones, which, which one felt the best. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, at, uh, at that particular time, it was a Hoyt. Um, but since then, I've shot friends, Matthews, that I really like. I've mm-hmm. shot PSEs that I really like. Um, you know, I, I'm, I fall in the category of I'm not brand loyal when it comes to a bow. Mm-hmm. Um, for it, it for me, it's all about finding what's comfortable. And that's what I would recommend to anyone starting is don't worry about the name of bow that you're buying. Um, find what feels the best to you. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're doing that, keep in mind of, of the price of that bow too, because the price that they're telling you is literally just that stick and string. That's not all the accessories that you need to buy too. So that piles up on top of it. And and so in terms of people talk about draw length, they talk about, you know, the the weight, the length, the uh, the, the distance between the, I want to say the, the axles, between the cam, something mm-hmm. like that. Yep. Like, is that just a matter of what feels good to you or are there, there are some kind of guidelines for, for what you should look for? I mean, obviously, draw weight, there's a minimum in most states that you can hunt with, but you also don't want something that you can't pull back. Like, I... Mm-hmm. Just physically, I can't imagine my wife pulling back a 70-pound bow. It's just... Right, yeah. I, I mean, it's basically, with everything that's out there, there's, you know, a point of everything gets slowly better until it's not any mm-hmm. better anymore. Um, so, and all of those things, as they get better, make the price of the bow more expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, so... When you talk about draw length or draw, well, draw length really doesn't matter. All bows, will, all compound bows, um, will be coming with a variable draw length. They'll okay. have a range. And when you go to that bow shop, when you pick the bow you want, they will fit you and set the draw length for you, um, or they should if they know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as the draw weight's concerned, basically, if if you're planning to hunt, um, you know, the minimum for most states now, Pennsylvania doesn't have a minimum draw weight, um, but a lot of states out west do. And they're, you know, 40 to 45 pounds mm-hmm. of draw weight. Um, you, For someone who just starting um, archery hunting like yourself, I would suggest buying a bow that has a draw weight that can be adjusted. Um, there's no reason to get one for the normal average male Mm -hmm. to get one that has a draw weight below 40 pounds because you're never going to want to shoot it below 40 pounds. Um, now as that draw weight increases your, um, feet per second or the arrow speed Mm -hmm. out of that bow is going to go up to a certain point. Um, so you, you sort of, you know, it's more energy that's carrying through that arrow into the animal. So the higher weight you can go, the typically better it's going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, you want to make sure that you can draw it back. 
uh, that you can, especially if you're hunting animals, you want to make sure mm-hmm. that you're drawing it back in a stealthy manner as well. Um, so like for a new person, like I said, I'd start with a variable draw length. For me, I just bought a straight 70 pound draw, mm-hmm. uh, draw weight because I knew I could pull it back. Um, I knew that was more than enough for what I'm, you know, the deer and the turkey that I'm trying to shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said, for someone new, you want to try to, you want to try to uh, find that sort of variable draw weight so you can start a little lower to get your form right and then Go increase it. Right. Okay. That's good information. I mean, in, in, is that kind of the variable draw weight? That's also true of the $1,500, $2,000 bows, or are they going to be fixed weight? Um, to be honest, I haven't looked at those okay. uh, more expensive bows, but um, they're typically going to give you options for that. Okay. Um, it, it depends on the make um, of whether they do um, give you the options or not. Um most, I would say for the, so there's basically three price points when it comes to, to buying a bow. Mm-hmm. There's the low price point, um, which is a very starter bow for, you know, typically youth mm-hmm. um, or someone that doesn't see themselves hunting for a couple years. Um, then you have the, the mid-range bow and then you have a high range bow. And each of those prices are going to be going up. The high range is around that $2,000 mark. Yeah. Um, I went with a mid-range bow because I was getting a new bow for the first time in 15 years. Mm -hmm. Whatever mid-range bow I picked was going to be better than what I had before. Sure. So um, that ran me about $800, $900 for the bow, um, which is a lot of money. But it's also been five years and I haven't bought any, you know, I haven't bought another one. Mm -hmm. Um, But, I mean, yeah, it... I had the option of variable draw weight. I chose to just go with the straight 70 because it felt good. I knew that it, mm-hmm. that I could pull it back. Yeah. So, And, you know, I don't know if you have, have opinions or thought on, on this, but there's obviously a, a, a growing market of, you know, used secondhand, thirdhand bows that are good quality or, you know, in that middle tier, that upper tier, but, but because they're four or five years old and, and people have, I, I'm, I'm assuming people just like gun guys who, who see the new thing and they want to buy the new thing. I'm assuming that's true of the, the bow, the archery community. You know, do you yeah. have any thoughts on buying a secondhand bow? Yeah. I mean, I personally, I've never done it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my personality just lends itself to, I want to buy something new. I don't want yep. to worry about other people's problems. Um, but I know people that, uh, personally, and I'm very close to every one or two years, they will buy a new bow. Um, so there are, it's not even bows that are four or five years old. You're buying a bow that is one year old or two years old, um, for a very reasonable price. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely an option to go for. Um, something that, uh, if I didn't have the disposable income I had, I might go for. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I would have no problem doing it, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I just, for some reason, don't typically go that route. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I just, I know, I know a couple of guys who got screaming deals on bows, and they seem perfectly happy with them. I don't, I don't know that they actually have have taken anything with the bows that they they bought, but you know, it's just something I'm I'm always interested in an opinion on. Um, yeah, that that's definitely an option. It's an option a lot of people go for. Um, and I would never tell someone not to go for that option. Yep. Um, I would just, if you're, if you're buying it right from a person, mm-hmm. I would make sure to meet them at an archery shop and have that shop just check it out and make yep. sure it's there's no cracks in the in the limbs or there it's going to need any major work or anything like that. Okay, that's good advice. You know, that's that's kind of like the every can I say that. Every pistol I've ever bought, I've bought secondhand, but I've always done it at a gun shop so that I could just, well, A, you know, hopefully not get shot in a parking lot, but second, (laughs) like have them take a look at it before anybody goes anywhere. I, you know, I know a couple of guys who own shops around here. Yeah. uh, It's like buying a used car from someone and taking it to a mechanic just to have, or bringing a mechanic along just to look underneath, make sure there's no major problems. Sure. That's that's that same line of thinking. 
yeah that's a great met that's kind of a, a good i don't know if it's a metaphor or, or or whatever but that's a great comparison to make um that's food for thought so you mentioned before about you know 800 bucks 900 bucks for just the stick and string what obviously you need you need to buy arrows you need to buy field points you need to buy broadheads you know you need to buy some of that extra stuff what are the the must-haves to go along with your brand new bow well and this is assuming that it's a compound bow yes um just because a lot of states i mean you can use compound crossbow recurve or longbow yep. um for archery season so uh just because i use a compound bow so it's just sort of sticking mm -hmm. in that sort of realm um, you're going to need to have a rest put on. You're going to need to have a sight, uh, a stabilizer. Um, and then after that, you're sort of getting into things that you don't have to have, but for some people, some people like them, some people don't. Um, so things that I have on my bow, I have, um, limb stabilizers because all the limbs on these compound bows now are split limbs. So they're not one, well, not all of them, the vast majority of them. Um, basically have two pieces of metal uh, coming up mm -hmm. on the limbs instead of just one. Uh, so you put, uh, and some of the bows will come with them, uh, you put some rubber in between them just to sort of keep the sound down and the vibrations down. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a string silencer on my bow to try to help keep some of the sound down whenever I shoot at a deer. Um, and then two things that I like that uh, some people don't like or don't use uh, is what's called a kisser and a peep. Uh, so the kisser is just sort of like a round disc that goes around your string and um, it basically you almost kiss it. You put it at the corner of your mouth whenever you draw okay. back. Uh, so it just gives you an anchor point to make sure you're always in the same position when you're mm -hmm. shooting. Um, and then with that, the peep would be up a little higher on the string and it's just a round disc with a hole in the middle It that's sort of put inside your string a little bit that you actually look through that to your sight. Um I like it. It keeps my form better. I've tried it without. I typically don't have consistent enough form without them. So personally, I like them. It's up to you whether you want mm -hmm. to or not. Um, now, going back to two of the must-haves uh, with the rest and the sight, you have all kinds of options that you can pick from for both of those. Okay. So for the rest, uh, you can either have a fixed rest where it's just a piece of metal two pieces of metal, something that just sort of stays out there all mm -hmm. the time. It holds the arrow the whole way through. Um, the next option is a drop rest. Uh, so it actually, when you pull your string back, the rest would come up to put the arrow where you want it. And whenever you shoot and you let the string down, the rest goes down. So that way you don't get any drag on the arrow okay. as it passes through. Um, and the last one is a capture rest. And that's personally what I use. Um, Mine's a whisker biscuit. It basically has all these little whiskers and mm -hmm. a circle, and it holds the arrow. Uh, I know it slows down how fast my arrow shoots, um, but I'm only worried about a hunting situation. So if I'm stalking a deer or even having to move quickly, semi-quickly in the mm -hmm. stand, I don't want to have to worry about the arrow falling off my, my rest. It just, okay. It's always where it needs to be. And yeah. then um, with the sight, you either have a single pin, which is just one pin mm -hmm. that you move to the yardage you need it to uh, with a little dial on the side, um, a multi pin, which are fixed and set. So you'd have typically one for 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards, however many you need. Mm -hmm. And then they also have a red dot site now. Um, okay. You just have to check, just have to check and make sure your state allows it. Okay. Um, I know Pennsylvania does. It's basically like a red dot site that you would have like on, a, on an AR. Um, I, me personally, I use the multi pin cause that's what I've always used. That's what I'm comfortable with. Um, that's sort of figuring out what you want. Sure. And of course, and of course, with all those options that I mentioned about rest and sight and stabilizer, depending on what one you pick, it might be cheaper. It might be mm -hmm. a couple hundred dollars. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, I have a coworker that just bought a new bow last year. He bought a top of the line bow. He basically bought top of the line accessories for everything. And he spent $7,000 on his bow. <laughs> um, now he, he literally does not use a gun. 
I mean, okay. everything he hunts, he hunts with his bow. So uh, I understand. Yep. Um, I would not personally spend that much no. on a bow uh, unless I won the lottery. Yep. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, you can make it as expensive of a sport as you want it sure. to be. Can I, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you an opinion question, you know, more so than we've, we've been doing at, at ATA this year, everybody was talking about the, it was a bow site that like calculated the, where you wanted to hold that took into account like arrow drop wind speed, like all that stuff. It looked like a, Almost like a video game. Yeah. Did you, did you see that? I did. It sort of had like a built-in range finder yes. and, and everything. And then would apparently would, sort of like the red dot site, would put the dot where it needed to be. Yep, exactly. Yes, I did see that. What did you think? Um, so first, I think that's cool. Yep. Um, second, I think, I wonder where technology is going to stop. At what point mm-hmm. is it no longer ethically fair chase? um to use something like that sure um me personally uh i would not use it Mm -hmm. um and that's compounded by the fact that i've heard some guys who were there uh, talk about it and say that it was not good that the range was bouncing around and the dot was bouncing um not something that you would actually uh, apparently it was a thousand dollars yes um so not something that they would drop the money on right now um obviously the technology as they're talking would have to come a long way. Yeah. Even if it did, I can't, I honestly can't see myself dropping any money on that <laughs> as an option. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, it got me in the, Oh, it's, it, it's really cool. It's cool technology. It's the type of technology that I would take for a range toy, but I would, I don't, I think I'm in the same boat with you. I think that based on my, admittedly completely uninformed opinion when it comes to archery hunting it just seems to get away from the core of what if i was going archery hunting what i would be trying to do yeah i i've been toying for the last two years with buying a recurve bow um so i'm actually personally thinking about going backwards technology wise Mm -hmm. um and they're coming out with more stuff so um, but that's, I mean, that's the way of the world, you know, that's, that's what yep. humans do. That's how we've gotten to where we are now. So, um, personally, I can't see myself using it, but at, when I say that, I sort of feel like the old man, you know, <laughs> yelling about crossbows and then yelling about the compound bows, yeah. and, you know, type things. So, and that crossbow thing, just as an aside is, is interesting. Um, in Massachusetts, the only way you can hunt with a crossbow that's not poaching right now is if you're disabled. So if you have oh, really? a turn, ro- turn rotator cuff, tar- you know, problems with your neck, anything like that, any physical ailment that keeps you from drawing back a bow, you can get a note from your doctor, give that to Fish and Wildlife, and they will allow you to hunt with a crossbow. Wow. See, uh, that's the way Pennsylvania was until about six or seven years ago. Yep. And then they finally made the switch. So I, it's, it's, um, for someone who doesn't have time to practice or for a younger kid, um, it's a great option. Mm -hmm. Um, and even for any, I don't have a problem with people that that hunt with a crossbow. In my opinion, if you're, if you're hunting, I don't, as long as you're doing it within the legal aspect of hunting, Mm -hmm. I'm cool with it. Um, while I I do want to shoot a deer with a crossbow just to sort of say that I've done it. Yep. Um, the thing that worries me about people that use crossbows is they see commercials on TV that show that they're accurate out to a hundred yards and yes, they can be accurate out to a hundred yards. However, <laughs> they're not typically carrying enough momentum when they mm-hmm. enter an animal at a hundred yards to kill it ethically. Yeah. Um, so really the max, the, the real max range of most crossbows is like 40 yards. Yeah. Um, you know, once you get past that, it, it's tough, yeah. you know, it, it, as far as the ethical side of it's sure. concerned. Yeah. And to me, and again, this is, this is borderline uninformed opinion, but, and, and this is more driven by cost proposition, not by like, this is just for me. Like, the hunting crossbows that I see out there that are 
seem to be well regarded, well respected from reputable companies that aren't going to buy be a buy it, use it for a season, throw it out, buy a new one, are just significantly more expensive, even at Cabela's, than kind of a, a comparably kitted out bow. You know, even a, a compound, and it just it seems like it's a losing value proposition now fortunately for me you know knock wood i'm not disabled i I don't have any problems i can draw back a bow so it's it's not going to be an issue for me but you know it, it just it's one of those things that i'd like to to do once to say i've done it like you but I, I just i don't i don't fully understand the appeal yeah I, I mean we have neighbors up at our cabin that that's what they hunt with um mm-hmm. it's it's really fun to shoot um, yep. and it, it may, it, without a doubt it, in my mind, it's going to be easier to hunt with because you can use a rest. Mm-hmm. You have a very low powered scope on it. Um, it's basically shooting a gun. Just you're only using an arrow instead of a bullet. Um, but to, for me personally, and my opinion is that I enjoy archery season is my favorite season. I enjoy the aspect of, um, you know, getting close enough to my target animal mm-hmm. and then having to basically shoot offhand at yep. that animal. You know, yep. um, this year I had a, a really nice buck, um, one that I was after at 45 yards. Um, I didn't take the shot. It was mm-hmm. too far. I couldn't yeah. ethically take that shot with a crossbow. I would have had no problem whatsoever. So that to me takes some of the um, fun out mm-hmm. of yeah. hunting an archery season. No, I get that. And I just, I did a quick Google just to make sure my facts were correct about Massachusetts and and crossbows. And there is a discussion going on right now in the legislature and, and, and the folks who, who regulate all this to make crossbow hunting legal for everybody. So we'll see if it goes anywhere, but yeah, I I was actually surprised to hear you say that it wasn't already Um, just because Pennsylvania is typically one of the last to enact that kind of stuff and the fact that we already have it it's amazing to me that another state doesn't man that the model of massachusetts should be hold my beer like we're just we're we're behind the times when it comes to some of this stuff and it's it's for no good reason yeah other than this is the way we we've always done it it's like sunday hunting right can you guys hunt sundays in pennsylvania nope absolutely not we cannot i can only as a working individual hunt uh one full day a week Wow. Without taking off work. And that's Saturday. Yep. Yep. We're there too. We are a uh, retired state <laughs> when it comes yeah. to hunting. All yeah. the retired people can go out and hunt as much as they want. Um, the working class individuals cannot. cannot. Yep. Well, yeah. that's that's why we got to win the Powerball. And... Yeah. 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 Do it that buy, way. Buy enough land to have my own state and make my own rules. <laughs> <laughs> What's the line from the Patriot? The, the bad guy goes to Cordwallis and says... Tell me about Ohio. Yes, whatever it exactly. Is. Yes. Although I would not buy Ohio as a Western Pennsylvania person. Um, <laughs> we do not like Ohio. So um, New York would be okay, though. I could see buying a little bit of upstate New York. Yep. What about like um, Illinois or Iowa, Iowa? Kansas, yep. um, even a large chunk of Pennsylvania I'd be okay with. Yep. Um, it just Ohio is tough. Yeah, Ohio no, I get is that. tough. I and, get that. And Maryland, uh, Ohio and Maryland, those are the sort of the two tough ones. Okay, well, I'll I'll keep that in mind for when I win Powerball <laughs> and and I'm shopping for land. I'll 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 avoid those states so that you can come and visit. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of arrows, right? So we've talked about rests, we've talked about bows, we've talked about sights, we've talked about all that. What should you look for? Uh, so basically when it comes to arrows, um, you actually want, um, a heavier arrow. Um, we want to try to keep the arrow, the heavier it is, the more momentum it's going to have to carry it through the animal. Um, so when we shoot like for a deer, for example, um, the best shot that you can have is getting the top of, in my opinion, getting the top of the heart, the bottom of the lungs, and you have what's called a pass-through shot. It goes in one side, mm-hmm. comes completely out the other. Um, what, with 
everyone gets caught up in that feet per second, how fast the bow shoots. Mm -hmm. Um, The lighter the arrow, the faster it will shoot. The problem is when you have a lighter arrow by laws of physics, you don't have as much momentum when it meets the target. Um, So you end up with arrows that don't penetrate all the way through. So this is Um, the old kinetic energy thing, right? Yeah, the whole kinetic energy thing. Um, It's something I've learned the hard way uh, with two of the deer uh, that I've shot, uh, trying to go faster Mm -hmm. um, and then not getting a whole pastor. Now, both of those shots were more than enough to ethically kill the animal. Uh, It just comes into play as far as following a blood trail Mm -hmm. and trying to find that animal afterwards. If you have a pastor, two holes equals more blood. Uh, as opposed to one hole or a hole that has an arrow still in it. Mm -hmm. So um, you want to try to stay a little on the heavier side if you can. Um, And, but no matter what you, what weight arrow you choose and it, there's a whole mathematical formula. If you um, uh, Google Levi Morgan is one of the best archers in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And he um, did a lot of work for Lancaster archery uh, about that kind of stuff. Uh, So if you look on their website, they will tell you based on your draw length and draw weight, what size, you know, how heavy your arrows should be, things like that. No matter what you pick, the big thing you want to keep in mind is you actually want your center of mass to be closest to the front end of that arrow as possible. Okay. Um, Because then it keeps it from wobbling in the air. So that way it flies straighter. Okay. Um, most of the arrows you can buy now, um, have some sort of carbon fiber, uh, that they're made from. Um, the ones that I use have, um, carbon fiber and fiberglass sort of mixed in a little bit. Um, Mm -hmm. it's a low amount of fiberglass, mostly carbon fiber, um, aluminum arrows. I don't even know if they sell them anymore, but that's what I started with. Okay. Um, the arrows that I shoot now, uh, it's actually, they, I use carbon express, uh, again, not that I'm necessarily brand loyal. They just mm-hmm. work for me, so I keep using sure. them. Um, I use the Maxima Blues. They have Maxima Blues and Maxima Reds. I like them because they're actually built with three three different stiffness levels. Uh, so the front of the arrow is very stiff. The back of the, I guess, front third of the arrow is very stiff. Back third of the arrow is sort of medium stiffness. And okay. then the middle of the arrow is sort of, I mean, it's stiff, but it sort of gives flex. So if you watch a, an arrow being shot out of a bow at slow motion, you mm-hmm. actually see it like wave. It creates waves in that arrow. Yep. The sooner we can get that to stop, the the truer the arrow is going to fly. Okay. So by allowing the middle of the arrow to flex while the two ends stay on the point you want it to go, it actually stays gets truer faster. So that's why I like them. Um, the maximum reds are for fixed broadheads and the maximum blues are for mechanical broadheads. Since I shoot a mechanical, Mm -hmm. I went with the maximum blues and I'm very happy with, with how they fly. So that's what I've gone with. Okay. And actually, you know, as long as, as long as, you know, you brought them up in terms of broadheads, right? So there's people who swear by mechanicals. There's people who swear by like the traditional kind of all steel fixed broadhead. What's, why do people, why the debate there? That it's 100% um, personal opinion when it comes to that. Um, The debate started probably in the late nineties, early two thousands where it got heated. Um, That's when mechanical broadheads really started to gain momentum. Um, And because it was, early in their production there were a lot of lemons uh ones that didn't perform they were supposed to um or they were just designed poorly so they wouldn't open when they fully when they hit the target or they would open early mid-flight and send your arrow the wrong direction Mm -hmm. um so guys that had that experience they they typically swear by um fixed um the only time that i would personally say you must shoot this type of broadhead uh, is if you have a low draw weight. So if you have a draw weight below about 60 pounds, I wouldn't uh-huh. suggest a mechanical uh, because you're relying on the force of impact to actually open up those blades. Uh, so then I would say use a fixed blade because you know it's going to cut on contact. It's going to do damage. 
after that, once you get past about 60 pound draw weight, use whatever you feel comfortable with is really the best what I can say. Um, okay. I shot early in my career of hunting 20 years ago, I shot Thunderheads, which were a, a three blade fixed broadhead. Mm -hmm. um, and they flew sort of funny, but I knew that whatever I hit, it was going to cut on contact. Um, since then, I've changed to the mechanical rage hypodermics. Okay. Um, mainly the reason why I changed was because I didn't have to change my, my pin. Um, for sighting in my bow, whether it was a field tip or that. So that's the big advantage with mechanicals is they're low, they're very compact. So they fly truer to what a field point would. Um, so I like that. Then when I shot my first deer with it and I had a massive two inch, uh, hole mm -hmm. on the, in the side of the deer, uh, that sold me, um, it was it was unbelievable. It, the The first buck I shot with with those hypodermics, um, I actually cut three ribs on the way in, wow, and three ribs on the way out. So six ribs total. It cut, didn't break. Actually, cut through them. So wow, yeah. From that point on, I was sort of sold on them. Um, but it's extremely personal. It's what you know. You have to find what works best for you. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest mistake most guys make is they buy a pack of broadheads, they screw it on their arrows, and um, they go out and hunt with them. Uh, you have to shoot them at a target. You have to sacrifice one of those broadheads into a target yeah. to know where it's hitting, to make sure it's getting the penetration you want, um, make sure you don't have to make any changes mm -hmm. uh, to your sight or you know, sighting in your bow. You know, and that's real. I mean, that's that's a parallel to to gun hunting, right? I mean, you 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 spend a lot of money getting a load or a round, not nearly as much as you know buying a broadhead that you're going to fire once and and you know and lose. But you know, you there's a there's a parallel there. Um, you know, I would never in a million years take a a gun that I'd never shot and never zeroed and never you know lived with out into the woods to try to kill a deer ever in a million right. years. Well, and it's, it, it goes even more beyond that. I mean, this year, um, I had my 300 wind bag sighted in for rifle season. Um, I went and bought, uh, I needed another box of bullets, went and bought a box of bullets. Um, and when I shot, I was at a hundred yards. I was four inches to the right and six inches high. Mm -hmm. It was like, what's going on? Well, all the difference was, was the grain of the bullet. Um, just by, it, I didn't realize I picked the wrong box of bullets. Mm. Um, so that's where that's the parallel between gun hunting and archery hunting and as far as putting on broadheads and not shooting them ahead of time it can change based on how that weight is distributed how the air catches it in flight um, all kinds of different stuff like that can take it off course from where you have it sighted in for field points sure and and so just you know out of curi morbid curiosity what is a set of three you know of, of the the broadheads that you use versus forty five dollars. Forty five dollars for three, so they're fifteen dollars bucks for... each. Yep. And what about an equivalent, you know, kind of quality in terms of fixed broadheads? Uh, typically around thirty dollars. Okay. So you're I not saving. Say... You're not saving a ton. No, no. Um, and that's the archery world is, and you see it every year at ATA. Like you brought up that site, um, the archery world, they're always coming out with new and innovative products that are crazy. When you look at them, mm -hmm. um, personally, I'm very, uh, cautious when something brand new comes out. Um, I'm never the trendsetter that I'm using something the first year it comes out. I always wait a couple years, let other mm -hmm. people try them. And if they swear by them, then I'll say, okay, I'll use them. Um, something that, that there's a broadhead that came to mind about three years ago. I'm not going to say the name, but sure. um, it had curves in it um, on the blades and everything. And the idea was it was basically supposed to punch a hole. Um, I didn't, I didn't even want to try them. I said, I'm just going to wait and see what, what mm -hmm. other people say. And a lot of people had a lot of trouble with um, them just not flying true, it, okay. not even be able to sight in their boat with them. So, um, you know, you just have to be careful with the brand new stuff. 
while it looks good on paper yeah. um, and looks good in testing, that doesn't necessarily always translate to real world hunting. Yeah, don't don't the exa- don't be an early adopter when it comes to something that that you're going to use to to shoot at a living creature. Personally, I I say no. Uh, some yeah. people say yes, but personally, I say no. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to lie. I have really bad luck with being an early adopter. Um, so I think that I'm going to uh, I'm going to stick with you in, in terms of. <laughs> I'll stick with tried and true, and uh, and let somebody else work out the kinks on, on the other stuff. I I give the example. I bought a cell phone once, on the first day it came out. It was the um, the BlackBerry Storm. It was their first attempt at a touchscreen. Okay. It was a train wreck, man. I bricked three of them in six months just in like day to day use, and I. Oh. That was the end for me. On those same lines, that is why I let other people figure out the issues first, because yep. I bought a Zoom. Oh, yeah. you, you so, poor child. <laughs> yes, I had a Zoom. <laughs> um, and very quickly, within about a year and a half, I then had an iPod, because I realized the Zoom was not the way to go. <sighs> yeah, that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's, so, not, that, that's not one of my proudest moments. No, but you know what? You learned from it, right? I did that. And I that's did. what that's what this whole thing is about. And we're going to take a temporary pause here until next week. We covered a lot. There's obviously a lot to digest next week. We'll pick up where we left off and talk more about archery hunting for the beginner. See you then.